Happy Sabbath, church family. We're so happy that you've joined us for worship this morning. You could be anywhere, but you chose this church. I'm so, I'm so thankful that you could come here in person. And those on live stream, thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. We are starting a new sermon series entitled God, Encountering God, Finding Jesus in the Unexpected. In the month prior to this, in June, we have been going through the Word. And I made, a, I made a phrase saying that all roads lead to where? Rome. Well, in fact, when we look at Scripture, all Scripture leads to Jesus. So I think of this as like the sequel, the word to. We're going to look in, in, and apply it to look into the Old Testament and find Jesus in these beautiful stories. Stories you might have already read millions, hundreds of times, stories of the Old Testament that you share to your, to your kids, to your grandkids. And we're going to see a beautiful picture of Jesus like none other. And you'll realize that Jesus is laced all throughout the Old Testament. So are you guys ready? All right, so let's turn to Genesis chapter 32. It's also on your bulletin, so if you want to see it on your bulletin, if you don't know where it is, and maybe you're embarrassed because you're sitting next to someone that probably knows it, it's fine. Just go to the bulletin, Genesis chapter 32. If not, open up your Bible or your mobile device for the text. Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to start off in verse 22. It says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them, sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we have read your holy word, we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our minds. Then we, we may see a clearer picture of your character and your love for all of mankind. Be with us here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I feel a kindred spirit with Jacob because as he was wrestling this man, I too just thought immediately of my experience in my wrestling years in high school. For four years, I devoted my life into this craft. Four years, I devoted everything, the only sport, because I knew I'm too short for basketball. I'm not fast enough for track. The only thing I know that I could work on is wrestling, because you have to face the same person with the same weight class. They consider it to be the toughest sport known to mankind. Because you're facing someone with the same amount of strength, the same amount of tenacity, and the only thing that will bring you to victory is your grit and your endurance. So for four years, I committed my high school career in the sport of wrestling. And in that four years, I worked hard for it. If you know any wrestler, you would know that wrestling, the wrestling sport is difficult. Every practice, you're pushing yourself above and beyond to the point where you're heaving and hoeing. I've seen my friends puking it out because they were so tired. They were so dehydrated, but they continued moving forward. And I have never met anybody so strong and so had so much grit as wrestlers have. 
So for four years, I've earned the title captain in my wrestling team. And now I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm just saying I'm probably okay and I've worked hard enough to be able to earn that title captain on my wrestling team. But something happened the summer before my senior year. I was poised to bring our, our team into state. I was poised to rally up our team because I've worked with them for four years and these new upcoming crop of people are coming and I cannot wait to push them, put them in tip-top condition and ready to wrestle their heart out. But the summer prior, something was happening. You see, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I go to church on Sabbath. And every Sabbath, there was a preacher, my, my pastor at the time, preaching his heart out the love of Jesus, the love of God, and how it, what it means to be convicted to follow him all the days of your life. Now, as a teenager, for some reason, it was any regular message. It wasn't spectacular. It was just a simple message of Jesus Christ pricked my heart. And all of a sudden, I'm left with the dilemma. I love Jesus. I want to follow him all the days of my life. But for some reason, with this wrestling sport that I love and I, I am passionate about, their meetings, their competitions are on Friday night and Saturday Sabbath. And someone who wants to follow Jesus, I felt convicted. I need to keep the Sabbath holy. I need to keep it as much as I want to be in these wrestling matches. I love Jesus more. So my dilemma was so heavy on my heart. Keep the Sabbath, love Jesus, or fall into my convictions and just go with what I really want to do. This was in my heart. I was wrestling, no pun intended. I was really wrestling in my heart. What should I do? And without any plan, without any preparation, I came to my coach and I told him, I have to quit. I can't wrestle anymore on Friday nights. I can't wrestle anymore on Sabbath. I'll be there for practice. If there's any competitions any other day of the week, any other day of the week, I'll do it. But on Friday night and Sabbath, I cannot. This was hard. I committed social suicide. And here I find myself in my final wrestling match. I'm putting on my shoes, lacing it up. Got my knee pad all the way up to my knee where I do my shots. Put my headgear on. I felt that last sensation of that tightness in my, in my neck. I felt the padding of the wrestling mat and I got up on that mat and I'm staring at this guy who I do not know even to this day. The, guy, the referee comes up to me, you good, you good. All right, shake hands. Wrestle. And in that moment, I'm processing all my thoughts. How did I come to this conclusion? How did I come to this point in my life? I'm thinking about all the hazing that has occurred from all my teammates. Who is this Jesus that you are so willing to let go of this captain duty? The hazing and the bullying, even from my coaches. Jesus died on the cross. He also died and left the commandments, so you don't have to hold on to the Ten Commandments anymore. All this hazing, all this bullying, all this isolation. And I kept asking, Lord, tell me, did I make the right choice? Lord, I need your assurance. I need to know that what I'm sacrificing my social life to follow you is much better than this wrestling and this possible winning of state. And so we find the story of Jacob. Jacob, too, wanted insurance, and we all, too, want insurance, too. I mean, we pay about 100, what, $12 a year for Amazon Prime to have that assurance, that guarantee, that two-day delivery for that random little knickknack that you found discounted on Amazon Prime Day. You want that guarantee. You want that assurance that in two days, not in just five to seven regular business days, two days, you'll get your package delivered in your garage. 
You also want that assurance to find that soulmate, that someone that you can spend the rest of your life with, that till death do us part, whether in sickness or in health, I will be there for you. That guarantee, that promise that you are with that person. You also want that guarantee and that assurance that your family will be there for you no matter what, whether thick or thin, whatever a recital, whatever events, whatever special gathering or graduation that you have, you want your family there. But here's the reality check, my friends. We all fail. Amazon Prime, they fail. I had a package that was supposed to come yesterday. It said it's going to deliver later. In July 12, it was supposed to be two-day shipping. My friends, relationships fail. No matter how hard we try, our promises are like ropes of sand. And sad to say, too, our families fail. No matter how hard we try, we fail maybe in our ki- with our kids. We fail in showing up when they needed us the most. We fail, and that's just life. We aren't perfect. But yet, in our life, we want assurance. We want that 100% guarantee. We want that promise to be fulfilled in our lives. And when we look at the story of Jacob, Jacob needed assurance that his family was safe. We looked in the story that Jacob got up and took his two wives, two female servants, and 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. In this moment, Jacob is is on his heels. He's stressing out. Because prior to this, he has his twin brother Esau. And he sent this peace offering. And what is this peace offering? What did he send over? He sent 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys as a peace offering to his brother Esau. And oh, oh, servants, when you go to Esau, Let them know that I'm a servant. I'm not coming to fight. And all of a sudden, the servants come back. He says, Esau did not say a word, and 400 of his men are coming here right now. He's stressing out, Lord, I need assurance. My family is, uh, my family needs to be safe. Okay, wives, go past the Jabbok River. I need to be by myself. I'm a ticking time bomb. You cannot be near me. My brother is seeking out revenge. He wants to kill me. Go ahead. I'll be alone all by myself. And he knew this day would come. The past, he can't run away from the past anymore because Jacob for so long has been trying to control his destiny even in the womb. You see, in Scripture, it tells that he was holding on to Esau's heel. And so that's why he was called Jacob, the supplanter. He is the one that holds on to the heel. Supplanter also means that he was a great deceiver. Anything you know about Jacob? Probably the bad parts. Jacob, what did he do? He stole Esau's birthright. What else did he do? He also... He also stole Isaac's blessings by pretending to be his brother. And then as he is left leaving the house and Esau's trying to kill him, he finds his way into Laban's household and the deceiver is deceived by him. He stays in Laban's house 20 years, hoping to find his one true soulmate. Instead, he gets two. He was deceived. Jacob, in this moment, he confesses as he's all by himself. I'm a deceiver, Lord. Lord, I want nothing but for your assurance that my family is safe. Lord, help me. At the very last moment, where he feels like he cannot do anything, he cannot, why, um, he cannot push his way into his own destiny, his own choice. He is left with a singular moment to pray to God and ask for help. And then all of a sudden, as he's praying all by himself, a hand 
touches him. In the middle of a night, a strong hand is laid upon him, and he wrestles this unknown figure until daybreak. Verse 24, it says, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. We don't know who it is. Some, some people think that the traditions of the time was that they were river demons, that when you pass a river, there is a demon that you'll have to encounter. He doesn't know who this is. He doesn't know who this adversary is, but he continues to fight until daybreak. No matter how strong his lock is, he can't submit him. With all his might, with all his strength, he cannot beat and best this opponent. And in pain and anguish, something comes out internally that makes him realize his true struggle. No, it's not his physical pain. No, it's not his physical anguish. It's the struggle that's coming out from within. He is realizing the sins that he has done for so long, from day one of his life, from being a deceiver to his brother, to his family, to Laban, and to everything that he's been trying to do has led him to this very point in life where now he is fighting some unknown adversary. Verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with a man. This man with a simple touch, not any fit, nothing forceful, but with a simple touch, his hip was wrenched. His hip was out of socket. He's too young for hip for hip problems, am I right? And so Jacob all of a sudden realizes this is none other than God himself. This can't be any regular person to be able to touch my hip and he would be in searing pain. And so in this moment, he takes this opportunity. Verse 26, he says, The man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's realizing this physical torture that he's going through is much more deeper within. What's really inside is that he is tired of being a deceiver. He's tired all his life, and he's asking God, Lord, save me. I won't let you go until you bless me. You know, physical pain has a way to really bring out the anguish that's really in your heart. I remember in California, I was preparing for a marathon. I was in mile 10, and all of a sudden, I'm just running around this track, this really long track. One, one, one loop is almost two and a half miles. So I'm running. Nothing is happening around me. Nothing crazy People are just running with their dogs. People are having fun. And all of a sudden, you see me sobbing my eyes out. I am literally weeping. For some reason, this pain and this physical anguish somehow brought this anguish within me of all this pain, all this pent-up emotions I've been holding for so long came out. And all of a sudden, you see this man running, crying his heart out, like, (laughs) And so it is with this pain and the physical anguish. For some reason, it brings out something that's in our hearts. And so in this last match, this man is tough as nails. I see him. I'm staring at him. This is my last match. This is what I want to prove to my teammates that what I am doing today, that what this match is, is not in vain that I am truly wanting to follow Christ. And so as I'm trying to prove myself, this man is so strong. Nathan will show a video. Don't get too distracted, but this is, this, this is my last match. And this man was super strong. Every time I tried to hold him down, he found his way to get on top of me. Every time I try to get into a half Nelson, he finds his way to kick his foot out and find his way to submit me, getting two more points. Two-minute two round, two rounds, three rounds at the end of this match. 
I am tired. I cannot control my emotions in this mind. I'm just thinking to myself, I need to win. I need to win. This is my moment. I need to show to my team that I'm following Christ. That I need, Lord, assure me, this is it. And so I'm wrestling this man. And all of a sudden, I find this small window of opportunity. In my last 10 seconds of this round, I find out that I am down in my points. There's no way that I can win. This is like literally 10 seconds left. But then all of a sudden, we're on, our, on the floor. We grapple and we hold on to each other and I'm holding on for dear life. My arms are tired. My whole body is tired. I'm heaving and hoeing. I'm sweating profusely. I'm just holding on tight to him. And all of a sudden, I see that window of opportunity. I grab onto his arm, I hold it tight like a, like a nice headlock. I grab his arm, I pull it down, and I grab him and I submit him. And anything, if you know anything about high school wrestling is that you need to have both shoulders pinned to the ground in order to be deemed a submission. I find myself connected on the ground and I'm squeezing tight. I hear my coaches screaming at me, hold it, Ronnie, hold it. I see, I'm looking around, and I see my whole teammates just cheering me on. They were bullying me just a few, few trains ago, trainings ago. And all of a sudden, I see them cheering me on. I'm holding tight, and I just continue to squeeze. And it, I hear my coach just say, just sit down, sit down. And I hold on tight, and I see this guy slowly loosening up his strength, and I gain the victory. I gain the victory of something I thought, never what I thought imaginable that I would win. This man was stronger than me. He was taller than me. He looked scary. And here I am, this, this little boy that before wrestling matches, I would listen to a whole new world to calm me down. This little boy is fighting this Goliath of a man. In this point, this turning point, I left everything on the mat. I surrendered it all, and I gained the victory. You see, in Jacob's end, Jacob learns to not trust himself, because that's what he's been doing all of his life. He's been conniving his way. He's been weaseling his way out of every situation known to man. He found a way to get the birthright. He found a way to, to put on hairy, hairy clothing on him so that he would deceive Isaac. He went to Laban. He was deceived himself, but he was able to deceive Laban to get out of his servitude so that he continue moving on with what God is calling him to do. And that turning point, he realized he needs to trust in God and not himself. Amen. Nathan, you could turn off the video now. <laughs> and so we find in the text... Verse 27, it says, let's look at verse 26. It says, J Jacob replied, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and overcome. My dear friends, Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter, has now has his name changed after wrestling through the night, God himself. Bless me, Lord. Bless me. What is your name? Jacob. No longer Jacob anymore. But Israel. And if you look at the name of what Israel means, it's that God fights. My dear friends, God is fighting for you. I don't know how your life has been, but ever since that moment, I have been trying to make my way oh, to show that God is the one for me. 
I've been pushing myself by keeping the Sabbath holy, trying to make sure that I am that holy one to my teammates. But little did I realize that all I needed to know is that God fights for me. Exodus, 20, Exodus 14 verse 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. You don't need to fight your battles because Christ has fought your battles for you. He has fought your battles. Look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is a law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way that we could get into life every time we try no matter how strong we get, no matter how many people we wrestle, there is no way that we can gain this uh, salvation, this beautiful thing that Jesus Christ gives us. And so Jesus comes along and dies on our behalf. The perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that when He is on the cross, He has gained the victory. He felt that isolation. He felt that brokenness, but he knew that through that sacrifice, we can gain a new name. No more a deceiver, no more the one who has been working his way towards, towards a better life, no more whatever who you are as you, you call yourself, but now you could call yourself Israel. God fights. So as we close on this message, God fights for you. All you have to do is stay still. And when we see the story of Jacob, that physical manifestation really reveals what was truly in his heart. He wanted assurance that his sin, his pardon. And my dear friends, as we close, whatever sin that you're going through, that sin that has been wrecking havoc in your life, for years, decades, from generation after generation, you can claim the victory because God is blessing you today. Our praise team is gonna come up and we're gonna sing a beautiful song. What a wonderful name. If you have been blessed by this message, there is a connect card in front of you. If you wanna connect with us, if you want to talk to a pastor, if you want to have baptism, if you want to start a relationship with Jesus and again that new name in him, write your name, send this, deacons will be in the back to collect the offerings, but if you also tech savvy, click, scan that QR code, God wants to connect with you and God wants to fight your battles for you. Let's sing this beautiful song as we close, let's rise.